It was an act of violence that could never be undone. A knight whose consequences would live on in the body for the rest of his life. Looking back, there was no way to prepare for what lay ahead. For the shadow that would be cast over the heart. The spaces he would not be able to enter anymore. The music that would be taken from him. The truth that would be denied. I am not the person who was attacked. I am not the person who lay on the ground, trying to move my legs. That person is Scott. I am someone who loves him very much. Uh, this is my best friend from when I was younger. Hope this little care package arrives safe and sound. I've included my little magazine, thought you would like him. Also just included a few little treats from London. Hope you're still in good spirits. I was incredibly moved by the courage and grace you had during this time. I know it's not much, but wanted you to know I was thinking about you and wanted to do whatever I could to help you get and feel better. I know that candy always makes me feel better. <laughs> Remember he like gave me a, a package of gummies or something like that. Let me know if I can do anything else to help you. One, two, three, love, Stephen. <clears throat> Stephen's from Nanaimo. Did I tell you about him? Mm -hmm. And he, I used to hang out with him all the time. 
And his mom would always hold our hands and, and do one, two, three, like squeeze one, two, three, which would mean I love you. And Sharice and I continued to do it when we moved away. Hmm. So what is all this stuff? Um, this is stuff from back when I was in rehab. I think it, it all compiled and then we, we put it in these um, boxes when I moved out of rehab and to here and I just never opened these boxes. It's been, I don't know, a year and a half. Um, and yeah, I, don't, I remember unpacking a suitcase when I was when I just moved in here, a suitcase that I'd had from when I returned from Korea, mm -hmm. and I just never unpacked it for the two months that I was in New Glasgow, and then I was attacked, and it had some clothing and some memorabilia, and, and I remember unpacking it, and just like being crushed, you know, looking at it, and remembering my life in Korea and how much I, I, I really did not like my situation in Korea. I, I found it stifling and I couldn't be openly gay. And then the attack happened and I I would I would have done anything to go back to that you know that situation that I found really unbearable and then I'm like well there's these degrees of unbearable and when I opened that suitcase it was just like yeah Alright, should I do that one now? Sure. Let me spin this out first. That's him on his bike for the first time. With his little gay smile. Mom! Look at it. Yeah. He's like... Like, ah. I'm riding a bike. <laughs> I love it. Just this is minutes before he fractured his arm and was unable to suck his thumb because of a cast like this. And how old was he when he still sucked his thumb? Three. Three. Let that be known. Yeah. <laughs> no. But that's a good one. You should reach that one. No, this one. Oh, oh it's, yeah. It's I love this one. This one, too. Covered with dust. Scott showing Gabrielle the flowers in my grandmother's, my mother's field. That's where I grew up. I met Scott playing the piano. We were both music students in university. The first time we met felt like finding an old friend. We were kindred spirits immediately. Scott spent hours at the piano every day. It was one of the most powerful ways he found to express himself.
On one of our long drives together, I asked Scott what he missed most since he lost the use of his legs. The pedal, he said. That piano pedal. I can spread it out better than so. I'm gonna bathe and shave and dress myself and eat solo every night. Unplug the phone, sleep alone, stay way out of sight. You sure it's kinda lonely, and yet yeah, sort of sick. Being your one and only is a dirty, selfish dream. <laughs> I'm a one-man guy in the morning, same in the afternoon. One-man guy when the sun goes down, I whistle me a one-man tune. One-man guy, a one-man guy, only kind of gotta be. I'm a one-man guy, I'm a one-man guy, I'm a one man guy is me. <laughs> I can't hear the harmony, <laughs> and there's no ukulele. <laughs> I discovered. <laughs> yeah. So we'll redo that with ukulele <laughs> later. <laughs> Do you know that song? Beautiful. Yeah, nice. I love it. It's so romantic. It's romantic. Well, a lot of things are so romantic. Yeah. Like, I hear loneliness. It's like, well, oh, I was thinking, <laughs> such an idiot. I was no. thinking, like, no. one, like, being with Only one. one. I'm a guy, yeah. and there's just one man for me. You know, like, you're yeah. my man. Yeah. Um, that's ahead. what I, I, that's what I, how I'd interpreted it initially, too. Which is kind of cool. I, and it's, it is. But then the lyrics are really. Um, I, 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 I. Be in my one and only. I'm gonna bathe and shave and dress myself and eat solo every night. Unplug the phone, sleep, sleep alone, alone, stay way out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's kind of lonely and yeah, sort of sick. Being your one and, one and only, only is a dirty, <laughs> selfish trick. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah I, I feel like it's a song that really resonated with me in university and still to this day because I feel like I'm going to end up alone <laughs> well you know, and I think everyone feels alone mm -hmm. at some point even when they're with people mm-hmm Do you feel like that's something like a lot of people who are either in the closet or not even in the closet? Um, well, I think everyone feels like their struggle is, well, it is unique. Yeah. And I think I'm realizing how traumatic it was to be in the closet for so long and how I never really thought of it as trauma. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the loneliness might come from, because trauma can be a very isolating thing. He's permanently paralyzed, is that the doctors are saying? That's what they're saying right now, yeah. Why would anyone do this? Um, 
we're not sure, but um, myself and his family and the people that know him, we feel like um, it may he may have been targeted because of the fact that he's gay and he's openly gay in town. It's been exactly one year since Scott was attacked. And on this anniversary, Scott wants to return to the street where it happened. Going through this again, it's it's hard because I'm flip-flopping between feeling numb and feeling really emotional about it. Like I'm sitting here on the street where I was attacked and I feel, again, like it's surreal. Like I'm disconnected. Would you like to get out of the car? Not right now, but maybe. I kind of just want to know if there's another light, and if I'm imagining, I don't know what it is about the orange light that I'm mesmerized by, but that is one of, the whole memory is washed in this orange light. And it gave it this his tone. I remember the feeling of the pavement under my head. I remember hearing them run after I'd been stabbed. And I didn't tell any of the the reporters, you know, that when I was in the bar and I looked at him, I was kind of checking him out. I got upstairs and I was looking for my friend and I called her name out really, I don't know, maybe effeminately um, to him. And then I looked at him and maybe he caught me kind of like looking at him in a way. And then I met, my eyes met with his eyes and I, I knew it was just this judgmental look. And then I was like, okay, I don't want to be up here anymore. So I went downstairs and just, you know, thought, okay, I'll, I'll hang out with my friends downstairs and be safe. And then, you know, walking here, ran into him. And in terms of the hate crime aspect, that's, you know, I have 
insecurities about it because I believe this thing and it hasn't been acknowledged by by our legal system. But both of my psychologists, you know, said that that's, that's what it was. I mean, it seems just so obvious to me. I, I know that look and I know it's just a look, but for me as a gay man, you can identify that look so quickly because you've experienced it. By the time you're 28, growing up in a, a small town, you know what that look, what that look is. And something they said in the ICU and the IMCU. Um, was that this all was the new normal. And there was something comforting about that, but then something really disturbing as well. That so much can be taken from you like that, and then all of a sudden you have this new normal to deal with. These are the images I find from when I went to visit Scott in the hospital, five days after he was attacked. They are a record now. Fragments of a time between two worlds. There was a time before all this. Hi! My name is Scott Jones, Stephen Conway's best friend! And I'm going to Nova Scotia. Graduates, good luck! What a camera! I guess I'm thinking of nature, playing outside. Yeah, I think when I look back on my childhood, the one thing I remember the most is just freedom. Being able to run through the forest in my backyard and the trees were like 
my best friends, these big giants all around me. And I remember, you know, there was a particular tree at my grandmother's house, a willow tree. I used to chase my sisters around the tree, just running in circles. Laying on the ground and staring up at the leaves as they would move in the wind and see the light. Days after the attack, Scott and his friends decided to start a campaign. The whole town had been shaken by what happened, and Scott was asked what message he wanted to share. From his hospital bed, Scott answered, Don't be afraid. And so was born an anti-homophobia campaign and a choir for social change. In there? It is, but not too bad. No? Okay. Do you want me to take your shirt? Yeah. And... Okay. Oh. Well, no, you go ahead. time for the song. Ready, and. Yep, so men, you step forward. Ready, and. I need more men, I need to hear more men.
Yeah, when you have it, you really have it. Okay. It's so good. What was it like when you first came out? Mm, it was, there was a lot of fear. When I came out to my mom, it wasn't like the greatest coming out story, you know? It was uh, tough, and I told her over the phone, um, which probably wasn't wise, but it was the only way I felt comfortable, I think. And she was, I think she was a little bit in shock, you know? And she is the one who taught us as a family to be accepting of everyone and talked about my Uncle Bobby and, and mentioned, you know, that he was gay and that that's 100% okay. Yet when it's, I think, your own child, it's different because you have this idea of what their life is going to be like. And that's what I remember saying. She had this picture of what she thought my life would look like. And then she, she said that she was worried about, you know, HIV. Um, you know, worried that I wouldn't have kids and all the worries. Um, and then since the attack, it's just now that everyone talks about it openly? Well, I mean, like everybody knows. Yeah. I think I'd still feel a little bit strange bringing home uh, a partner, but it's going to happen eventually, right? Right? <laughs> if Grinder works out. <laughs> Green Dad. I met a person who was working for the government. He actually recognized me and asked me if I was Scott's mom. I said, yes, I was Scott's mom. And he said that he was very grateful and thankful that Scott was bringing to light an important message about homophobia. He then proceeded, after some conversation, I really had a great conversation with him and he he said don't you think that perhaps now this guy's my age or maybe about 10 years younger he he said that he thought that Scott was quite naive in that he thought he could go out after midnight in Picto County that he himself had married in order to be socially accepted when he was young and he had beautiful children that he was very proud of. And that he, that was the social pressure on him when he was young. And that he had, since he came out and had his marriage had dissolved, he had actually tried to go out with people in Westville and been beaten up and in other areas in the community and been harmed because of that. And he said, don't you think Scott was somewhat naive? And I, that was a whole new concept to me. And when I drove home that night, I remember thinking, oh my God, I did not prepare Scott for the world as it is. Even though I think that's wrong, that I would have to, I really didn't prepare him. I talked to my daughters about things they should or shouldn't do. I never, it never occurred to me that I should talk to a young gay man about what's safe and what is not safe because I made the assumption that it was safe for him to walk on a street at any time of day or night, just like everybody else. Ways. There's life and death in there. I feel like 
apparently died. I can't get to sleep anymore. Before sleep is like when you're the most vulnerable in your day. Really? Because you're alone and you are alone with your thoughts. I think that's why I'm like pushing my sleep, like staying up, reading things or watching things. I don't want to be alone. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Okay, so breathe in happiness and breathe out nervousness. Breathe in sunshine and breathe out rainy days. <laughs> breathe in light and breathe out fear. Keep breathing.
Do you want me to tune it again? No, I'm kidding. No, you're not. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit, this is what I'm worried about, is that my legs are gonna go wild with spasms because Nerves. I'm gonna be nervous. Side of you, do you want? Um, yeah, on my right, left, my left. Yeah. So I will sing, I will sing and be brave. Sorry, <laughs> I will sing, don't be afraid. <laughs> as long as Oof, it's just too high for me sounds great I feel like if you just like yeah just let it go as long as you are here all I can say <laughs> so no, now we're it like, sounded great no it didn't <laughs> As a long... The thing is, no one is... It's so <laughs> yeah, fast. Now, it's so fast. Now we created a moment in this song that I'm going to crack up during. Does this look ridiculous, me standing? No. Like, I don't know. Does this look no. silly? Should I just... Is it worth all the effort? Yeah. Or should I just... It'll be fine. It will be fine. I'll be standing. If I don't follow my face, then it will be a success. <laughs> Where did the idea come to stand? Um, well, I've been wanting to do it for the last, like, year since I started speaking or, like, conducting in public. And I, I just never got around to it. And, you know, it would be the night before and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. But then I'd be too nervous. And so this time it was two nights before, and I felt like that was enough time. To <laughs> and, you know, like, it's so symbolic, you know, my fear of, I don't know, falling or looking foolish, preventing me from doing this. And, and it was just a moment of, like, okay, I want to, I don't know, like, be brave. well, and also, like, take, take a risk, be yeah. brave, but, like, just... Add a little excitement. Yeah. Yeah. And be vulnerable too. Yeah. Without further ado, please welcome an extraordinary human being, uh, Mr. Scott Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Hello. Holy cow. There's 1,100 people in front of me. This is pretty intense. The last time I was here, which was like an hour ago, there were, there were no people out here, so it's kind of uh, a bit of a shock. Um, I, I finally came out in, in high school, um, or sorry, at the end of high school, beginning of university. I told my friends uh, at choir, because choir was the one place that I felt like I could be myself. Choir's really cool. Um, regardless of what you may think. <laughs> and actually, when you were shouting at the beginning, I kind of heard like some notes in there, and I feel like you could all join, like a make, create a giant choir together. So I was just thinking back, you know, on everything I just shared with you my whole life, how I struggled with this closet and with this, this fear to be myself, um, to be accepted. Uh, by my loved ones. And, you know, this was a time when I was most afraid. I, you know, was paralyzed. And I, I didn't know why this had happened. And I, I to me, and I, I feel like 
the man who attacked me was also afraid, you know, and, and I felt like my community was really afraid for my well-being and my, my family was afraid. And it was just like I, I was done with fear and I didn't, I didn't want to hang on to it anymore. So the message, don't be afraid, was born and it was uh, encouraging to see that there were, there were that many people out there who um, cared about equality when my whole life I think I'd been struggling with that and felt like nobody really cared and then seeing that was really really powerful for me. Oh yeah, so um, I have thought for the last year and a half, I've done a lot of speaking and conducting choirs and I just, every time I do a speaking gig, I've, I've been thinking about how I, I really want to stand and I want to challenge myself to do that and I, I never do. Um, and so today I would like to stand and uh, challenge myself and I feel like that's what it's all about. That's what I've been talking about, I guess, is being vulnerable with, with all of you and, and with everyone and the importance of vulnerability. And I feel really vulnerable right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was actually going to say that, that when I, when I finally stand, <laughs> that I would like everyone to uh, start screaming and, and clapping and <laughs> yelling at the top of your lungs. All right, here we go. This was the first place that I thought of. The first place I thought I wouldn't be able to come to after I was attacked. All right. Okay, you, you feel this is the best way. Okay, so let's make a plan. Yeah.
I didn't really... I don't think I've really processed this yet. I think it's... finally starting to come out. Why are you doubting your own, like are you doubting your own 
truth. Mm. So much has been taken from me. And that hasn't been acknowledged, you know. Why? It's just, it's just, I find him walking like a tightrope between seeing the good and just like diving into the bad. And it infuriates me because this all happened because of some asshole who didn't know any of us. And yet, what he did is affecting. <laughs> So much more than just me. It's like rippling into my social life, my family life. <laughs> yeah, like he still has power over me <laughs> because I don't know how to fix this. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> We got a cut. If you were to look in the public records, you would find that Scott's attacker pled guilty and was sentenced to 10 years in prison for attempted murder. You would not find any reference to a hate crime or to the fact that Scott is gay. In the court of law, Scott's sexual identity was both invisible and insignificant. If we cannot name the attack for what it was, how can we begin to address the problem? In Scott's heart, this is the wound that remains. I don't remember a time ever that I've written something that or even had like scratches and big long pauses. Can I share it with you? And it's not finished, but Shane. I've been thinking of reaching out to you for some time now. Honestly, I don't know what I want to say to you or why I want so much to talk to you. All I know is that something inside of me is compelling me to write this letter in the hopes of one day meeting with you face to face. Am I angry with you? Yes, I am. Do I wish that I could rewind time so that I never ran into you that night? Absolutely. But that is not why I want to reach out to you. Truly, I am not interested in making you feel guilty for what you have done. 
I am sure you feel that anyway, and are reminded of the consequence consequence consequences <laughs> of your actions every day. But that is not the driving force behind this letter. I believe that we are both we both hold the key to recovery and healing. We both have the power to try to right this horrible thing that has been done. In some way, your experience is a bit like mine, uh, like being paralyzed, like being imprisoned. Both are incredibly unique experiences. Aside from paralysis being like incarceration, these experiences are similar in that the only person who can truly understand our experience is us. The only person who can understand the trauma from that attack is me. I've heard this experience being linked, likened to that of an, an astronaut, and I like that because it is so true. We have both ventured into uncharted territory, into the darkness of this attack and the trauma that has resulted from it, and the trauma that has come before it, and the trauma that put us both here to start with. We have been linked through this terrible attack, and I merely want to talk about that. See what comes of it. Maybe nothing will. Maybe I will be so angry that no words come out, but only screaming. Maybe we'll both be in shock. Or maybe we'll kickstart a healing process that we both so desperately need right now. But we will never know unless we meet. I wasn't expecting that to be emotional. Scott tells me that forgiveness is a journey, a process, a choice that he is faced with every day. As part of his journey, Scott decides to travel back to the place he grew up. This oh, is uh, beautiful. I can't. I can't even. <laughs> yeah, I remember coming into here, somewhere along here, holy memory, and I was, I was in like drama class, like right around here. I don't know why that building in behind struck me as where it was, but whoa. It was like an after school program and I'd come in on the bus. I remember seeing the harbor there. Turn right on the main road. 
We're getting closer. Yeah, all the colors are different. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, it, was it 44 Kanaka Drive? Is that really true? Wow. Yeah, and the trees here are just so much bigger. So as a kid, they seemed like giants. They still seem like giants. But maybe that's because I'm a little bit shorter now. <laughs> so I'm about the same height as I was. <laughs> I feel like we spend our whole lives taking care of who we were when we were kids, you know? Like, I think we all have little, little people inside of us. And so, like, seeing where I grew up as a child Remembering that, you know, who I was, who I am, and how much, you know, you have to, in life, talk to yourself as, as if you were that little kid and not, not, uh, not an adult, you know. Time can do so much to a person. Time and experience, you know, the experiences that we have. Like, as I was thinking about that, like I was thinking about myself, but afterwards I also thought, again, about Shane, you know, and, and how just because we were both on a side of that knife, you know, like, and he, he 
He has a little boy inside of him.